What can Christians learn from Jews? In 2020, the statue of the slave trader, Edward Colston, was pulled down and unceremoniously dumped in Bristol's Port Harbour. People are now questioning the continuing presence of other statues in public places. Two such statues are on the facade of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. The first statue is Ecclesia, representing the church. Ecclesia is a graceful woman wearing a crown and carrying a chalice for new wine, a cross for crucifixion, and a flag for resurrec resurrection. At the back of her head is a halo showing sanctity. The second statue is Synagoga, representing the synagogue. Synagoga is blindfolded by a snake because she has not turned to Christ. Her crown has fallen to the ground. Her staff is cut in two, and she is holding the tablets of the law upside down. These two statues are not unique to Paris. They feature too in England and Germany. What's more, they were buttressed by the Christian doctrine of supersession that the church had supplanted Judaism. All Judaism had to do was to wither away and die. But of course, it did not do so. Ecclesia and the synagogue were two offspring of the Jew Jewish religion, which existed before the destruction of the Jewish temple in the year 70 of the Christian era. Before that destruction, there were various Jewish movements, some of which we encounter in the New Testament. The Sadducees who ran the temple, the Pharisees who upheld the tradition of the Torah, often justify unjustifyingly getting a bad press in the Gospels. The John the Baptist movement, the Essenes, an ascetic movement which we know about through the Dead Sea Scrolls, and also the Jesus movement, which was increasingly attracting Gentile converts. Of these various movements, only two were to survive, Christianity and Pharisaic Judaism. The latter, Pharisaic Judaism, morphed into the rabbinical synagogue Judaism, which is very much alive and well today. The big irony is that Christianity and Judaism both changed their spots after the destruction of the temple. For Judaism, the whole sacrificial system centered around the temple collapsed. The successors of the priests and temple officials, the Cohens and the Levites, have lost their respective priestly and temple functions. The opposite trend has happened in Christianity which started with loose and varied forms of ministry, these morphed into a sacrificial hierarchy with bishops, priests, and deacons performing the sacred functions of the Eucharist. Christians and Jews swapped their spots. These two offspring of Judaism became rival siblings acting out the myth of Jacob and Esau 
and worse still, sometimes Cain and Abel. Christianity became the more powerful sibling, resulting in bullying and denigrating Judaism with appalling consequences. Christianity claimed that it had superseded Judaism. The idea of supersession was derived from interpretations of the New Testament, particularly the letter to the Hebrews, in which the author, who is not Paul, suggests that the old covenant would become redundant. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. But the New Testament doesn't speak with one voice. For St. Paul, God's covenant with Israel was not obsolete. Paul said, the gifts and calling of God to Israel are irrevocable. We can argue how far certain New Testament texts can be taken as supporting supersession. But there can be no doubt that the texts were later used to frame a theology based on supersession. That theology morphed into official calumny against Jews, anti Judaism. Medieval and anti Medieval anti-Judaism led to the more modern anti-Semitism, which we still encounter today. Anti-Semitism grew all over Europe, culminating in the Holocaust with a massacre of six million Jews. Christians need to consider how far Christianity contributed to the Holocaust. Did centuries of persecution and denigration of Judaism by Christian authorities lead to the Holocaust? And if Christianity was not directly responsible, many Christians undoubtedly were. After the Holocaust, any claim of Christian superiority of Judaism sounded blasphemous. Christians had to find new ways to relate to Judaism involving penitence for past deeds and attitudes, but also humility. Supersession had to be abandoned. Whatever the theory, it was clear that Christianity had not supplanted Judaism. For 2000 years or so, Christians had failed to convince the vast majority of Jewish people that Jesus was their savior. Furthermore, the Nazi persecution failed to stamp out Judaism. Indeed, Judaism flourished after the Second World War with new confidence and vitality. So instead of missions to the Jews, which mostly fell on deaf ears, Christians started to learn from Jews. Indeed, Jews started to teach Christians not to become Jews, but to appreciate the Jewishness of their Christian heritage. We learned that the more we understand our Jewish heritage, the more we can grasp the Christian message. So today, we will be hearing Jewish voices teaching us about Jewish ways of life and the Jewish background of our scriptures. The first voice will be Lionel Blue. Lionel Blue was Britain's favorite rabbi in the same way that Richard Coles is now Britain's favorite vicar. Lionel spoke to people of all faiths and none in his pithy radio slots for thought for today. He spoke with compassion and humor. He described the Jewish way of life in Britain in his book, To Heaven with Scribes and Pharisees, subtitled 
the Lord of Hosts in suburbia, the Jewish path to God. He dappled with Christianity at some points in his life, but fortunately for Radio 4 listeners, he never converted. He describes his dappling like a love affair in another book, My Affair with Christianity. Lionel shines a light for us on various aspects of the Jewish way of life. I will choose some to illustrate the different perspectives we have. Jewish life centers around the family and the home in contrast to Christianity centering more around the church. This trend started right at the beginning after the destruction of the temple. Lionel states, Part of the temple inheritance entered into the Christian church. In Judaism, the inheritance came to rest in the privacy of the home. With his characteristic humor, Lionel describes the sacrificial roles now taken on by the inhabitants of the home, which on the Sabbath becomes a lived-in temple. He says, the father became a priest, the mother a priestess, and the dining room table an altar. The furniture of the temple from the Holy of Holies itself came to rest beside the salt cellar, the mustard pot, and the sauce bottle, the candles, the clothes, the white of the tablecloth brought holiness and mystery of tremendous events into the surroundings of everyday life. The emphasis on the home may explain why the Jewish community seemed to manage much better during the COVID lockdown when church and synagogue services weren't permitted. The home liturgical ritual involving worship was able to continue unabated. My impression is that Christians fared worse, unable to access the sacraments, and finding worship by Zoom rather unsatisfactory. After the destruction of the temple, there was no sacrifice to perform, so loyalty to God became centered on observance of the precepts of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Apparently, the Torah contains 613 commandments. Jews seek to observe the commandments with varying degrees of strictness. How to observe the laws is found in oral tradition, revised and written down as halakha, which may be translated as the way. Christians have totally misunderstood the nature of Torah observance. It's not a set of legal rules which are necessary to obtain salvation. Judaism is a religion in which the grace of God is received. Observance of the Torah is a response in gratitude to receiving God's grace. As Lionel Blue was told by his teacher, Leo Beck, Judaism is your religious home, Lano. It is not your prison. Observance of the law is not a potential penitential discipline, but a response to the love of God, which he has shown to his people. Having a hierarchical church, Christians have often the fantasy that there should only be one view on everything involving truth claims. We have creeds setting out what we should believe. We have bishops who define doctrine. Catholics have a magisterium which can give authoritative pronouncements. And if we try hard enough, we can find the one truth on difficult ethical and theological issues. The overthrow of the high priest in Jerusalem 
following the destruction of the temple, but that they meant that there was no central authority which could bind all Jews. Most Jews don't have the fantasy of being able to find and express only one truth. Lana Blue expresses the Jewish way rather poignantly. Judaism is a noisy religion, he says. The faithful are rarely silent. And if their mouths are not enough, Jews use their hands as they, as they speak, argue, and discuss. They do this with each other, and they do the same with God. Jews also study in pairs, so they can see different arguments. One can be suspicious of cold logic. Blue goes on to say, Judaism doesn't speak in the language of Greek logic. Its flexibility is given in the language of the mashal, the parable, and its secrets lie at the heart of jokes. So in Judaism, there is less search for one truth, orthodoxy, as there is in Christianity. This has meant that the search is more towards right conduct, orthopraxy. We've seen this in Torah observance, but it is also manifested in dealings with the society and those in concern for those at its margins. When the Jews were sent into Babylon, Jeremiah gave them this advice. Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. In the last few centuries, Jews have had to be a wandering people, yet wherever they've sought to settle, they've contributed immensely to the economic and cultural life of the society in which they lived. Blue sees that work is the center of religion, not piety or theology. He says, for a Jew, work may not be the center of God's religion, but it is the center of his. The universe is not there to do our will, but we are there to help it along. Work and business are holy matters, for creation is not in a state of rest. Blue sees God as employer, and we, his workers, as employees. We are co-partners with God in the work of creation, a sentiment now happily expressed in Christian pulpits when describing our responsibility to the environment. Blue tells us that Jews have a healthy Jewish suspicion of mysticism. The nuts and bolts of life are more important, it's far more important to feed the family than to seek mystical experiences. We should not turn our back on the world. That is the reason for involvement in politics. There can be no firm delineation between religion and politics, as sometimes argued for by politicians, mostly without a theological background. For Blue, the Bible is a political textbook, but also an argument which is never settled. After all, he, as he says, Jeremiah specialized in foreign affairs and most prophets had something to say about the politics, both internal and external of the people. So like Marxism, Judaism is a materialist or worldly religion intimately involved in the macro and micro environment in which we live and work. Like Muslims, Jews are known for their philanthropy and charitable giving. There is a desire to build a better place in this world, what we might describe as God's kingdom on earth. 
On the 17th of November, Jews observed Mizva Day, a day devoted to social action, fulfilling Jeremiah's advice to seek the welfare of the city in which we reside. Christians have woken up to realize that they have a sibling who has flourished despite denigration, persecution, and in more recent times, attempts of illumination. Christian attitudes to Judaism need total revision. Naturally, we see in our sibling something of ourselves, but we also see differences perhaps differences in emphasis. We can look at ourselves in a new light. This makes us ask new questions about ourselves. And here are my questions. You may well have more. Has our sibling chosen a better path by placing more emphasis on the family than the hierarchy? May we debate and challenge views, whatever their pro provenance, do we spend too much time on worrying about orthodoxy, right belief, rather than pursuing orthopraxy, right conduct? Now here's a further point to consider. The Jewish religion is embedded in family and community, despite being affected by the voices of secularism, Jew Judaism is still incarnated in the Jewish way of life, in family, in customs and observances, in ways that Christianity might once have been in the West, but now is much less so. Contact with Judaism prompts us to ask, in what ways is Christianity now incarnate in our lives? We've just looked at differences, but let us now turn to what we share, a common scriptural tradition. We share together those scriptures forming the vast majority of modern Christian Bibles, namely what Jews call the Tanakh and what Christians call the Old Testament, or increasingly the Hebrew scriptures. The Hebrew scriptures in the Christian Bible are set out in a different order to the Tanakh. In the Christian Bible, the Hebrew scriptures end with the book of Malachi, containing the prophecy, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Christians have interpreted this to be a prophecy of the advent of Jesus, who is revealed on the next page of the New Testament, where the New Testament begins. Indeed, for the most part, Christians have interpreted the Hebrew scriptures as prophesying the coming of Christ. We find this most dramatically when we hear a recital of Handel's Messiah, with the prophecies of Isaiah being used to forecast the birth of Christ. For the Jews, the Tanakh does not prophesy the advent of Jesus. The Tanakh ends with the second book of Chronicles. On his last page, King Cyrus ends the Babylonian exile and, in, and encourages Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple there. The return to the promised land, the land promised to Abraham, is the climax of the scriptures. Engagement with Jewish scholarship now enables us to see different perspectives in the scriptures which we share with our Jewish friends. Two commentators can help us in this quest. They are Amy Jo Levine and Marx V. Brettler. These American Jewish academics specialize in biblical studies. They've collaborated on two books which explain the Jewish background of our scriptures. One book, is the Jewish annotated New Testament, giving a Jewish gloss on these Christian scriptures. Their other book is 
the Bible with and without Jesus, how Jews and Christians read the same stories differently. Here, the two authors seek to put the Bible books in the context in which they were written. But they then go on and describe how subsequent generations of Jews and Christians have found differing perspectives and the Jewish interpretations not surprisingly lack the Christian gloss, which we are so used to hearing. The book cover shows Mark Chagall's Abraham and the Three Angels. Chagall, the Jew, shows the typical Jewish interpretations of the story, promise and hospitality. But Chagall gives hints of the Eucharist and reminds us of the Trinity in Andrei Rublev's famous icon. We are reminded that there are multiple interpretations of this picture as there are the Bible. Christians should not focus exclusively on the coming of the Messiah, but can profitably learn from Jewish interpretations. Let's take the fourth of the servant songs found in the second part of Isaiah. In chapters 52 and 53, be here. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Many of us can't hear those words without the music of Handel's Messiah playing in our heads. And these words will be familiar to Christians as they are read every Good Friday. It would be difficult for Christians not to connect the words with the passion of Christ. Levine and Brettler would say that that was an entirely legitimate interpretation for Christians to have. No one is telling us that we should not make this connection. But how did the original author think of the man of sorrows? That's not easy to fathom. There's no reference to a future Messiah in the song. The song was written during the Babylonian exile or a short while thereafter. So the servant might have been the people in exile, or it might have been a prophet in exile suffering vicariously for the sins of the Jewish people, or might have been an entirely imaginary figure. We don't know, but that just adds to the mystery this great poem. Later, the Jewish tradition didn't centre very much on these poems, perhaps a reaction to the polemical use made of them by Christians. For some, the servant was the whole people of Israel, for some a messiah, for others an individual like Moses. The Jewish tradition of identifying many candidates for the role may help us broaden the applicability of this song for today. That insight may lead Christians to see the poem referring not only to the passion of Jesus, but also suffering humanity. Naveen and Brettler point out that servant also in Hebrew means slave. The poem could refer to all those in slavery or who have been trafficked. That insight that may point us to the Jesuit liberation theologian and martyr Ignacio Elecuria. For Ignacio, the suffering servant is anyone who discharges the mission described in the songs, anyone unjustly crucified for the sins of human beings whose suffering provides a kind of expiation through its demand for a public and historical return to righteousness and justice. Today, both Jews and Christians 
can see the suffering servant, the refugees, the asylum seekers, the trafficked, and the enslaved. By sharing us various interpretations of the song, Levine and Brettler have widened our perspectives how it can be read. This happens when Jews and Christians study the Bible together. Our eyes become open to new interpretations. But what about the New Testament? What we can learn, can we learn from critical but friendly Jewish perspectives? In the past, emphasis has been on the divinity of Christ, which with less account being taken of his humanity. We see this in Holman Hunt's Light of the World, where a divine Jesus is carrying a lamp and is knocking on the door. The emphasis on Jesus' divinity started to switch 50 or so years ago. 1969, Dennis Potter wrote a play, The Son of Man, in which Jesus' life and death is portrayed without miracles, more markedly, without the resurrection. How do we find what the human Jesus was really like? Well, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber said, we Jews know Jesus in a way, in the impulses and emotions of his essential Jewishness that remains inaccessible to the Gentile subject to him. Well, in the light of that comment, who can tell us what the human Jesus was really like. So let us turn to our last commentator, Jesu Vermes. He can tell us much as his life embraced the different types, both Christianity and Judaism. Vermes was a Hungarian born from assimilated and not particularly observant Jewish parents, but in a rising time of a rising strident anti-Semitism after the First World War. The family saw the writing on the wall and converted to Christianity, perhaps hoping for an easier and safer life. But that did not stop the anti-Semitic taunts that Fermi's received as a boy, nor did it stop the anti-Jewish laws being applied to his father, who was forbidden to work as a journalist. Vermeer's opts for the Catholic priesthood, the only way for him to get into higher education. But as a Jewish convert, he was rejected both by the Jesuits and Dominicans. One wonders how Jesus would have fared if he had applied to join those orders at that time. Burmese's father is sent to a concentration camp. Burmese describes his last meeting with his mother before she had to return to the Jewish ghetto. She wore a yellow blouse to conceal the compulsory distinguishing mark of the Star of David. She was returning to her solitude in the improv improvised ghetto I watched the yellow figure of my mother until it reached the corner of the street and disappeared. I never saw her again. Both Burmese's parents were murdered in the concentration camps. Their conversion to Christianity didn't save them. Burmese somehow survived the war despite many close shades. After the war, he joined the Fathers of Notre Dame, an order whose aim then was to convert Jews to Catholicism, but it was then starting to change course towards promoting Jewish-Christian understanding. Vermes came to England to seek an academic career 
where he met his future wife. He left the priesthood and the church. Much later, he joined the liberal Jewish synagogue. Fermis is justifiably famous for his work on the Dead Sea Scrolls. But for our purposes, he wrote about Jesus in the context of Jewish civilization in first century Palestine. His first of many books on the topic was simply entitled Jesus the Jew, which placed Jesus in first century Palestine. He's helped us understand a bit more of the human Jesus emerging from the study of the Gospels. Burmese says that Christians should no longer see Jesus as the Christ of the church, but neither, neither should Jews see Jesus as the bogeyman of Jewish popular tradition. tradition. Burmese identifies Jesus as one of the charismatic Hasidim, or devout miracle workers in Palestine. He introduces us to Hanina ben Doza, a first century Galilean healer on the edge of respectable society. Hanina is said to have performed many miracles, but one stands out particularly for us. The son of the famous Pharisee Gamaliel was suffering from mortal fever. He dispatched two of his pupils to go to Hanina, who lived farther, far away. Hanina, when hearing the news, retires to pray and then comes back and says, go home, for the fever has departed from him. The incredulous envoys record the time he says this. And when they return to Gamaliel, they find the boy killed and are told it was the same hour as Hanina pronounced it. You will have noticed the echo with Jesus healing the centurion servant or the son of the royal official, depending on which gospel you are reading. Christians have given various names to Jesus. Some of these names have suggested divine approval or imply a relationship with the divinity. Vermes puts these names firmly in the context of the culture of first century Palestine. He doubts whether Jesus ever saw himself as Messiah or referred to himself as the son of man who would come with the clouds of heaven as described in the book of Daniel. During his lifetime, Vermis says that Jesus may have been linked with a prophetic figure in the tradition of Elijah or Moses. He may have been addressed as Lord, as, but as were miracle workers and teachers. Jesus may have described himself as a son of man, but that was used in Aramaic to describe any man or even to refer to oneself. Similarly, people may have called Jesus son of God as they did miracle workers and exorcists. The Son of God rang true due to his relationship with his heavenly father. But Burmese says that it is unlikely that Jesus ever saw himself in it as in any way divine. And that's not surprising, is it? Because if Jesus saw himself as divine, he wouldn't have been human. Vermis has done us a considerable service by placing Jesus in the context of Palestine in the first century. He makes us see Jesus in his humanity, which we've sometimes forgotten. Vermis sees Jesus as belonging among holy miracle workers in Galilee, but he seems to have been struck by the character of Jesus. He says that no student of the gospels can help but be struck by the incomparable superiority of Jesus. Jesus laid bare the inmost core of spiritual truth. Whereas others spoke for the poor, Jesus took his stand among the pariahs of his, of his world, those despised by the respectable. It is Jesus' standing by those rejected by society 
that marks him out as special for Vermes. So contact with Jewish ideas has broadened our outlook on scripture, both for the Hebrew scriptures and also the New Testament. Christians and Jews can learn together. Fortunately, the growth of scripture reasoning gives us all a chance to exchange our respective interpretation and learn from each other about our scriptures. Learning together about the scriptures should not just be seen as an academic exercise. Both Christians and Jews may read together the injunction in Deuteronomy, you shall love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. This text, like others, should galvanize us to work together for the common good and for those who have no one to speak to them. We can work together to protect the stranger. Earlier, I said, the Christians and Jews have had quite a fraught relationship, much like Jacob and and Esau. But times have changed. Indeed. Jacob and Esau themselves became reconciled. For Jacob, seeing Esau's face was like seeing the face of God. Since the Second World War, Jews and Christians have been similarly reconciled although that does not mean that the relationship is free of tensions. For the most part, we are like siblings who fell out ages ago, but in maturity have re-established friendship and respect. Ecclesia and Synagogue may still be on the facade of Notre Dame Cathedral, but the relationship has changed. This is reflected in a more modern sculpture, Ecclesia and Synagogue in our time, situated outside the Institute for Catholic Jewish Relations in St. Joseph's University in the United States. Synagogue and Ecclesia are sitting together. They are looking over each other's shoulders. Ecclesia is reading the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Synagogue is reading the New Testament. 